Welcome. Our first introduction song is by Brian Wallen, an amazing guitar player, so please take a listen. Thank you. I just wanted to welcome you guys to the Yes We Cannabis Forum. We have amazing experts, 16 I think, I don't know, I can't count that far, but I'm going to call them out kind of in alphabetical order. We have uh, Larissa Bolivar, Larissa? Yeah. Larissa is the founder and executive director of Cannabis Consumers Coalition, a nonprofit cannabis watchdog organization focused on protecting consumers' rights and ensuring businesses engage in ethical behavior. Next is Michael Bowman. Michael. Michael helped found Sustainable Biodiesel Alliance, an organization that promotes a local model of biofuel production. He is also a member of President Obama's Champions for Change initiative and he serves on the National Steering Committee for and was a founding member of 25 by 25, 
an organization whose goal is to get 25% of America's energy from renewable sources like wind, solar, and biofuel by the year 2025. Thank you. Next, we have Sean Coleman. Welcome. Sean is a lobbyist specializing in cannabis policy. Thank you. Short and sweet. All right, so this is where it's not uh, in alphabetical order anymore. David Williams. Oh, my kind of guy, David. All right, we'll skip him. Adam Dunn. All right, I think you guys know Adam. He's host of the Adam Dunn Show, and he moved back to Colorado just to focus on hemp clothing. He's been in the business for 20 years. David Kowalski. David. <laughs> David is CEO of Cannabis Network Radio. <laughs> Welcome. Miguel Lopez. And, and also Tiny Martinez, if the two of you guys could come out. They are co-founders of Denver's 420 Rally. Very respected here in the area. Thank you. All right. Kayvon Kalatbari. Everybody knows. Oh, wait a second. I didn't give you your intro. Don't you want an intro? Uh, I missed it, but yeah, do it again. All right. <laughs> David, libertarian candidate with a large beer. Oh, libertarian candidate for attorney general. I'm sorry, just to make that clear. All right. So back to Kayvon Kalatbari. He is the owner of Denver's oldest and Colorado's second oldest dispensary, Denver Relief. Are you here? Hey. Robin Roberts. Yeah. Yeah. Robin is president of Pikes Peak National Bank in Colorado Springs. She's developed a particular expertise in the regulations and reporting requirements involved in cannabis banking. Leland Rucker. Leland is a longtime Colorado journalist. He is a writer about marijuana issues for the Boulder Weekly, and it's an amazing column called Weed, Be Weed Between the Lines. I love that. All right, Nicole Smith. Nicole is the founder and president of Mary's Medicinals. She is the exclusive producer of transdermal, I can't even say that word, transdermal cannabis products, including patches and gels. Discreet delivery, which is kind of like sex toys, I don't know. Uh, that's cool. I like that. Tom Tancredo. He was a congressman for five terms, and he also ran in 2010 as the Constitution Party candidate. He actually got 38% of the vote. Woo. Jason Worf. Jason is executive director of Southern Colorado Cannabis Council, the oldest industry organization in Colorado, the voice of everyone in the cannabis policy space. Thank you. All right, now we have an amazing person, Mayor Mike Donovan. You have to stand while I do your intro. <laughs> Except I can't find it. No. Oh, no. Don't go anywhere. All right. So Mike is the antithesis of the political 
polit professional politician. He is fiercely independent and refuses to accept money from anyone. He believes that both the Democrats on the left and the Republicans on the right have sold out America, pandering to the share of corporate and PAC money. He understands that the intellectual elites running the Democrats, I don't know, I don't think Democrats can be that smart. <laughs> You're the exception. <laughs> Uh, and um, that the intellectual elites running the Democrats want to control your decisions because they know better than you and what is best for your family. Mike fundamentally rejects the idea and big government categorically and believes that we need to reverse our current path towards socialism by creating more liberty and less government. On the other side of the spectrum, Mike also reject rejects the imposition of religious intolerance by segments within the Republican Party. These social matters are best resolved by adopting public policy choices that promote liberty for women over their bodies and marriage equality for all couples. His track record in Glendale over the past 15 years includes reducing the size of the city's staff by 40%, improving the city's bond rating from BB- to A+, redeveloping the city's municipal center, the list goes on, and of course, you guys, it's really long, but you all know Shotgun Willies. Yes. That's, that's there, too. I, I, I wouldn't know. I've just heard of it. Anyway, thank you guys for being here. I'm going to moderate, and, uh, and welcome to the show. Oh, they're here? We have more people. Oh, more people. Nice. Sierra Riddle. Yep. Sierra. Sierra Riddle is here. She has an amazing story. She re relocated from Utah to Colorado with her son, who was stricken by leukemia in 2012 and only given hours to live. He was first given chemo and was losing weight and wasting away. After being treated with cannabis, Landon's miraculous recovery was instrumental in changing Dr. Sanjay Gupta's point of view. And Landon today is declared cancer free. All right, Tom Tancredo, where are you? Oh, there you are. You are going to give a speech. <laughs> you're, you're a career politician. Come on, you know how to do this. <laughs> All right, here's the microphone. Um, up here, down here, what do you want me to do? Uh, stand right, up. Stand right there, front and center. Okay, uh, well, thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you for allowing us to say a few words about this issue. Um, Okay, I, I have been a Republican all my life, with the exception of the last election, the last gubernatorial election in, in 2010, when I indeed had to change parties to run as a Constitution Party candidate because the Republican that had been nominated was sort of a loon. So I ran, and yes, indeed, I ended up with 38 percent of the vote. Yeah. But, but the issue is this, and, and the Republican, by the way, ended up with 11 percent of the vote. <laughs> One percent less, and the Republican Party would have been a minority party in the state of Colorado. Now, I have. Um, what do you want me to do? Yeah, he wants this. There you go. Um, it has been. I, I served uh, five terms in Congress and was in the legislature a long time ago, so been around for a while. But m my proclivity, my uh, intention throughout poli my political career was to advance conservative philosophies. And to me, this is a perfect example of what conservatism in politics really means. And that is this. The government has absolutely no right to tell me or anybody else what I can or cannot ingest in, in my body. Uh, you know, I, I may, I may disagree with someone's decisions to do those things, but, but in terms of public policy, in terms of what the government has to say about this, there's nothing. It's, it should stay out of my life and yours and everybody else's. And, you know, I, I've never understood. I used to argue with my conservative Christian friends who would attack me on this issue all the time and say, well, you know, you really can't be. And I'd say, well, how do you feel? 
being in league with two groups in opposition to legalization. And, and again, this is to my, especially my conservative Christian friends, and I am, by the way, an evangelical Christian, so it's not as if I am eschewing that particular point of view. I'm just explaining to them the hypocrisy of, of saying that they are opposed to this when their they're two most ardent supporters in that opposition to legalization comes from whom? The cartels and the nanny state, right? It's the, th those are the two biggest opponents of this kind of thing. And how, do, how are conservatives supposed to fit into that? They shouldn't. They should not be in league with that. And so I have, all, when I was in Congress, I would vote over and over again to uh, say that the federal government could not use the money that we gave it in the, uh, in the Commerce State Justice Appropriation every year to go after states that differed with the federal government in their interpretation of this kind of, of activity. We were never successful in, in doing it. I, one year we actually got about 100 votes. That was the most. But things are changing, as you all know. And I think for the better. Now, you know, I'm going to be candid with you. I don't, I don't do this stuff. And I just never have. And, but it's not because I have any sort of moral issue with it or anything else. I just don't do it. I mean, I got a little red wine in the back. That's my thing, you know? And, uh, but, but I just don't care what you do. It's just not my business. It's not my, what right do I have to tell you this? You are, as long as you are not hurting anyone else in what you do, then the government has absolutely no right to get involved. That's been my philosophy. Um, and we've got a, a lot of speakers here, so I, I, will, I will end with this, but I'll tell you that this, is, this issue really did cost me the nomination this time. I ran for Republic, as the Republican candidate for governor, Colorado, in this last, in the Republican primary. And I was ahead until the last, I think, three or four days. I, I, I was in the thing for about a year, and I was ahead the entire time, of the entire field, until the Republican Governors Association, Chris Christie. Boo, boo, boo. Chris Christie did not want me to talk about two things, this and immigration. I, am, I happen to be very you know, staunch on, on uh, securing our borders. They don't want to hear that. And so they came in and did a drop of about $600,000, we have eventually determined to be the case. And, and this was the last several days. And this is the one issue they attacked me on. And they did it in two counties in El Paso County, which is in Colorado Springs, the Colorado Springs area, and in Mesa County, which is Grand Junction. Why? Because those two counties had voted more heavily against marijuana legalization than any other. So they went into those two counties, spent a bundle of money, I don't know how many radio commercials, it was just astounding. And, and I, I ended up losing to Bob Beaupre on this, because of this issue. But I don't care. I mean, you know what? It, it, you're not, I'm not going to change anything I believe in as a result of whatever political winds are blowing inside the Republican Party. I can only tell people what I believe. And, I believe, and what I believe is this. For this country to survive, for this republic to advance, it is imperative that people are able to lead their own lives and do so with the minimum involvement from government at any level. And that is the essence of what the founders were all about. That's what they were trying to do here. That's why they created this, this wonderful experiment. And so I have absolutely no apologies about the fact that I have supported this. Um, as I say, it's nothing I'm involved with, but I don't care. You do what you want to do. Your life is your own. And God bless you. And, and you know what? It, this will eventually. You know, it will take time, and there will be bumps in the road, certainly. There will be, you know, th things that happen that we look back on and we say we should have done it this way or that way. But nonetheless, this is a movement that I think will, in fact, succeed throughout the country and, in fact, the world. And, uh, and I think that's something we can all look forward to. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tom.
All right, so there wasn't a chair for me, but now there is. So I'm gonna, going to be sitting over there, uh, and we're going to be taking questions and answers from the panel, and then also from you guys out there, because there are a lot of different topics that we're going to be discussing. Um, is anybody on the panel interested in commenting on what Tom had to say, specifically government's involvement in smoking, doing, selling, growing marijuana? And if so, please speak. You guys, there are a lot of you. <laughs> speak up. Um, oh, either way. All right. As everybody knows, uh, my son is a, a cannabis patient. And having government involvement in our life almost took my son from me because I chose cannabis. And it's been one of the hardest fights that we have faced because there is no research, because we're not allowed to study it, because people are afraid to talk about it, our elected officials are afraid to talk about it, and if we don't start electing people who are going to fight for our rights, for our children's rights, and for you know our terminally ill children, then nobody else will. We have to uh, all agree that some involvement, of course, is always going to be there. But if we keep handing our rights over, sooner or later we're not going to have any. And how many of you in here have children? How many of you would choose cannabis if your child became terminally ill? And how many of you think that the government would not say a word about it? CPS would be at your door just like they were at mine. It doesn't matter uh, what college you went to, what town you're from, it, who you know or what you know. The only thing that they know is a certain standard, and that is that our children do not belong to us. Vaccinations, all of these things are huge issues that we need to have control of. These are our children, and like I said, if we don't stand up for it and fight for them and fight for their rights, then nobody will. Thank you. All right, I'm going to, I'm going to cut across. All right, so you guys were raising your hands, your parents here. What do you think about government's involvement in caring for your child and giving your child cannabis or any other drug that may not be legal at this point? Obviously, cannabis is now, but should we legalize all drugs? Anybody? I know me personally. Uh I have four daughters, and uh, if any of my children ever got sick, I would not see any problem with treating them with cannabis. Uh, it's the way I was raised, you know, it's, it's the way our, our, our ancestors were, were taught, you know, with the medicine man and the medicine woman. You know, uh, cannabis was used in my home even as I was a child, you know. My grandmother used to, you know, I remember one time she treated me with it for a scarlet fever. And uh, I mean, th these are people who were practicing uh, medicinal cannabis way back before it became an issue, you know, in the country, you know. So I don't, I don't think, I don't even think of it as a harmful thing. I think of it as a healing plant. That's all it's ever been to me. But you've been exposed to it, and you've been exposed to it as a child. How many people sitting here on this panel were not exposed to it until their adult lives and had to make a decision based on that? Anybody want to speak? Well, I, I'm happy to speak to it because I want to talk about <clears throat> my sort of unique first experience with, with cannabis, which was um, while I was at school at Juilliard. And the reason why that's an important story is because there's a certain perception about the cannabis user that a cannabis user, you know, can't think, can't read, can barely stand up. Well. I can tell you that when I realized that, well, I can tell you that I had a really good sophomore year at Juilliard, right? Um, I was using cannabis every day, all the time. <laughs> and I was winning competitions and winning auditions, and I uh, got a free ride to the Aspen Music Festival. So I can honestly say that I was not for cannabis. I would not live in Colorado well before we took a change of policy, because it's going back now to the year, two, year 1999, I guess. Um, and, um, and so after you know, this great sophomore year, I thought to myself, well, I did this great 
smoking weed all day, every day. Imagine what will happen if I stop. Well, I did stop. Um, and within a semester, I was on both academic and, uh, pro uh, and disciplinary probation. Okay, so how, how do other people okay. respond to the fact that we've all heard that mar marijuana makes you lazy? Obviously, marijuana had the opposite effect on you. But we've all dealt with that claim. How do we defeat that claim? Well, I, I've consumed cannabis daily since I was 15 years old. I'm now 31. Um, graduated high school when I was 16, college when I was 19, um, bought my first house when I was 19, uh, started my first business when I was 25. Uh, that was a restaurant. I had never run a restaurant before, didn't know what I was doing. We now have three restaurants under the same name, Sexy Pizza. Um, started Denver Relief. Again, didn't really know what I was getting myself into, but through sheer effort and um, determination made it happen. I'm now in a consulting I uh, own a consulting business as well in the cannabis space that has clients in 12 states, Washington, D.C., Canada. And we work with ancillary clients in Germany and the U.K. I've got a comedy production company and arts magazine. So I think if it makes me lazy that I don't know what I would do if I was off of it. I, my head would probably explode. Um, <laughs> but I think the ultimate discussion, the focus of not only the, the legalization of cannabis but all drugs is that it's a public health issue. It's not a criminal one. And we shouldn't be ruining people's lives for using something that really is safer than things that are legal, like alcohol or tobacco or fast food. And it's not just the, the enforcement and the, the incarceration cost that we incur as a society. It's the fact that we're creating barriers to these people's lives, uh, to, to education and to maintaining their children to maintaining a, a roof over their heads, to maintaining so you, employment. You, you bring up a point that's ish, an issue of politics, and we got a question from somebody, I don't know who. If you guys can also put your names, uh, first and last name, where you're from, that would be great. We're not collecting it, but it would just be nice to say thank you to whomever wrote the question. Which goes to what you were saying, a lot of people would say cannabis is a Democrat issue. How can Republicans appeal to the cannabis voter, to the community, to the industry. Anybody? I think I already answered that. I think you did. You know, this kind of circles back to the whole politic thing and how politics, Republican or Democrat, regardless, are involved in the cannabis movement. Our forefathers, when they started this great country, had the people in mind. The people's government, the people's choice, the people to progress the way they want to. Today, we are run by a corporate government with their own agendas and their own policies. The cannabis movement has moved forward and has catapulted into the limelight because the people exercise their voice and exercise their rights, especially here in Colorado when they went ahead and voted in 64. And now, when it comes down to politics, we have to start doing the same thing, not only here in Colorado, but as a community in a whole. It's not a matter of whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. It is our purpose and our business as a cannabis industry to reflect upon politics in a positive manner and influence the constituents to vote not the politicians, because just like everything else, this is a true people's movement. And that's why I'm sitting here. Mike is a people's politician. And that's, he's gonna restore the government back to the people and make it a people's government and not a corporate government. Congressman, you have a specific question. Actually, well, it's a question and a comment. Thank you for being here, I voted for you over a dozen times. You have a big fan. And then the second question, if you don't mind answering, is who do you support for president? Yeah, I don't mind answering at all. Um, the, of course, we don't know whether any of the people that I'm thinking of will actually even be entering into it, so I don't know. But I, I really like um, Rand Paul. It's a good guy. Why? <laughs> and, uh, I, I actually was in, a, uh, I was in a little group called the Liberty Caucus with his dad, Ron Paul, and we'd meet every uh, yeah. Thursdays. Yeah, that's right. 
So these are good guys. I have a question for this group, and it goes along with what we're saying here, because here's what I worry about. Colorado's passed it. Yeah, that's right. But remember I said there are going to be bumps in the road? Well, I'll tell you, I'm worried about this right now. You, you remember in Alaska, I mean, it passed originally. It re got reversed. I mean, it, it, you know, they took it back. Now they're going to, I don't know what the status is right now, but I know that they're trying again. But the reality is that this isn't necessarily a, a done deal here in Colorado or anywhere else for that matter, because there are all kinds of people who are opposed to the continuation of legalization, and mostly it's got to do with money. You know, they're, they're in some way connected with the, the, um, the establishment, with the drug war. I mean, so look this, how many this goes, people. This goes, and I'm sorry for if I sound like I'm interrupting, but we have so many it's people. Okay. But gets, this goes to another question. Uh, talk about organizing the 300,000 red card vote into a pack for future elections and TV, well, which goes to exactly what you're saying. How I'm, do we organize yeah, the money exactly. for politics? How do you get the red card vote? But I'm telling you right now, the, the concern I have is about the way in which at least the issue of edibles is being discussed and portrayed and the kids that get a hold of it. This thing will kill us. I'm telling you, it'll kill the movement. If we don't get a handle on it, if something doesn't happen, and I'm looking to you for the answer, because I truly don't know. I'm, it's not a rhetorical question. What are we going to do about that? This thing could stop the movement. If I can interject, um, the issue with edibles or anything else is a matter of education. Um, I don't think that, thank you. As we saw recently with the fear mongering over Halloween and that people were going to be passing out expensive marijuana edibles to children, it did not happen just like the razors and the needles didn't happen. It's just fear. We just have to let the industry regulate itself. It's a self-regulating industry. We just heard from Kayvon. We have all these wonderful business people up here. They want this industry to succeed. We have to give it a chance and not kill it with all of this fear mongering rhetoric. And if I could say something really quick, um, one, one thing the industry is doing, uh, Steve Fox, who really has been the, the, one of the main people behind uh, legaliz uh, legalization of cannabis, the progress that we've seen here in Colorado, um, he's started a council here, which I'm a founding member of. It's the Council to Regulate Cannabis Responsibly, and it's made up of can cannabis business owners and, and people involved with that. And we actually advocate for a five milligram um, start. Uh, the state advocates for 10 in the regs. Um, that's what they call a dose. Um, but it, for, for people coming out for the first time and trying and having these uncomfortable situations, it's, it is about education and people do need to start small. I'm glad you can handle your 300 milligram edible. That's good for you. But you know what? A lot of people can't and they need to know that it, they can have that situation. You have idiots like this Maureen Dowd, uh, this New York Times woman who just because she has a full candy bar, she thinks she needs to eat it. It's like having a 175 of vodka and thinking just because it comes in one package, you have to have the whole thing in one sitting. She didn't use common sense, but a lot of people don't. And us as an industry need to do what we can to help them. I just wanted to add on to Kayvon's point on edibles. I think it is about education, but I also think it's about creating responsible products as well. I am, our company makes the only transdermal delivery methods available, pharmaceutical grade delivery for cannabis, patches, gels, capsules, compounds um, that are low dose. The biggest risk of a child getting one of our products would be a choking hazard for the patch. 80% of what we produce is non-psychoactive. And this again goes back to education. There is a way and a method which, which you can use cannabis for a variety of ailments for anyone from two to 92 that doesn't have to create a high. Nicole, there, there's a question from Jesus Cervantes that actually brings up what, what you're talking about, but he asks, how do we politically balance public health and safety? And this goes to what you were talking about. So yes, there's an education issue that we're discussing, but politically, how do we get people to change their thoughts aside from the education? Uh, quite simply, I think it comes uh, through experience. And any of us who have had the opportunity to either use products or treat patients understand that on a daily basis we get dozens and dozens of stories who are now people that are off of pharmaceuticals or have cured their cancer or are 
just in better health, quite simply because they're using a harmless product. And that's what it should be about. It's not a, a party issue. It's about people understanding that it is a harmless medicine that should be accessible to anyone. How Excuse do we... Me. I'd I, like to respond as a marijuana educator. I think the ultimate thing when you're educating the public, whether they use or they don't use, you have to develop an individual's motivation and confidence of on, on, uh, trying to imagine uh, if they don't understand what it is that when they use or don't use marijuana. So when you talk about these education things, we need to start with our history, including like David brought up, you know, the founding fathers. But when we look at our history, this system is, and most people know that small business wants to thrive. This is what we look for. But is it really what our history is about when we talk about colonialism and imperialism and the roots of this country? We have to understand our roots in order to know where we're going and so on how the system is based on that. My friend Robert Corey in the background asks a very important question on Facebook the other day. What is, and we must ask ourselves this important question, what is the role of government? How do we define it? You can't sum it up and in what lengths does it go for? So we look at our history of our founding fathers while they were declaring all men were created equal, excluding women, murdering Mexicans, enslaving black people. And so is equality just but another word in America? Well, you, so, brought up a, you brought up something about small business, which is, I think, a good segue for where we're heading now. Um, the next topic, we have five topics. The next topic is hemp and agriculture. What's on the horizon for farmers and new energy? Michael Bowman is going to speak for a few minutes. Thank you, Tamara. And I'd like to take just a quick minute to respond to something that, that the congressman said in the, in the comment about uh, the corporatization. I, I've spent most of the last two years uh, in Washington working on the industrial hemp issue. So Senate 359 and HR 525 are the Industrial Hemp Farming Act of 2013. It's been uh, uh, a very widely supported uh, effort uh, on both sides of that, uh, both sides of the aisle, including uh, Senator McConnell and, and Senators Paul, who are the prime co-sponsors on the Senate side, along with Bernie Sanders and Senator Wyden. So a, a broad political spectrum behind this. And generally, I'm, I'm working on energy and environmental issues, so I'm usually up against the American Petroleum Institute with, with the things that I do. But in this particular case, what concerns me, and, and, and with your previous comment, was that uh, Senator McConnell in the last 10 days has come out and said he is against all forms of legalization of marijuana, even for medical purposes. And Speaker Boehner has, has, has made a very similar comment, you know, in, a little less recently. But Senator McConnell is the number one recipient of the pharmaceutical industry's lobbying money. So I think there is some real concern about where this is going because I don't think we have yet seen the pushback from the pharmaceutical lobby that we are going to be tortured with before long. So we've really got to get our act together because they will come at us for this industry just like the other, the other well-heeled industries do, just like the private prison industry does in Colorado at the, at the state capitol, and just like the private prison industry does on Capitol Hill. So we have really got to get our ducks in a row because we have not seen the tip of this iceberg yet. You're an expert in agriculture. <laughs> <laughs> so these are all, you're bringing up a lot of great points, but we want to hear from you about agriculture, hemp, and all of the wonderful things that growing marijuana and hemp does for society, does for the state of Colorado. Well, thank you for letting me take that little detour. So I'll get back to agriculture now. I'm a fifth generation Colorado, and my family's been farming since the 1890s out in Phillips and Yuma County. And uh, so, you know, we've really kind of got, I'm, I'm, I'm a bookend to, to a great grandfather who showed up on a train in, a, in an undeveloped prairie land. Uh, and we've gone through a whole transition of developing our water resources and, and, uh, and, and making ourselves a breadbasket of the world. What's happened is that it goes back to really kind of con my, my, my conservation ethic, and I was a Republican for 32 years before I couldn't take the social issue focus anymore, and so I had to leave for that reason. Uh, but, you know, I, what, was, what was really important to me was, is, was when I try to put, an, put, an, put a name around, or put a word to why, what, what I do and what I work on, it's, it's really about equity. 
whether it's resource equity or environmental equity. And when I see what we've, what we've been doing with, with the consumption of resources uh, in agriculture, particularly in our part of the world where we're harvesting fossil, fossil water at unprecedented rates, uh, we'll, we'll, f we'll mine a you know, millions old aquifer uh, in less than 100 years. And so for me, someone who wanted to see a strong, vibrant rural Colorado, I, I knew that we, we had to start setting the stage for a different crop because we were not going to be able to continue what we were doing uh, for much longer. We're already facing some resource challenges now. And as I looked across the spectrum of what our, what our options were, uh, clearly industrial hemp became one of the, the you know, the, the top crop. Uh, it, both because it needed substantially less resources, it was much more env environmentally benign, and it offered the opportunity to create a lot of value-added industry uh, in our state and in our country. Uh, being the largest, the world's largest uh, consumer market for this, for this was, it should make it an easy sell. Of, oftentimes when we find ourselves trying to introduce new crops into agriculture, we have to go through the whole process of marketing and making the case for why we need this new crop. Well, we already have a demand here. So it, all of that was really a no-brainer. The problem is, going back to the federal government again, is because we have a farm bill that has morphed itself over the last seven or eight decades that has really keeps the, the predominance of agricultural acres you know, in, in specific commodity crops uh, in, in a channel where you're chained to a Monsanto or a Syngenta or a DuPont or fill in the, fill, fill in the, fill in the blank. Uh, you know, very, you're, you're in the stream, and, and if you were with the, uh, in, within the farm bill, then you, you, you have to raise those crops. And so it's a very difficult system to exit. And so it really does take a combination of, of just sheer will, and in this particular case in Colorado, state policy to help us start that exit, because, because again, of the corporate influence that happens on a number of these issues, including the farm bill, uh, we will never see a substantial change of the farm bill from the, bot from the top down. This is, has to come from the bottom up, and we have clearly started that ball rolling in Colorado. Thank you. Adam, I wanted I'm, to I'm, ask you because you're, hold, hold on. You're just one moment. Including, yes. Can I, I, I'm glad he brought up, brought up Monsanto, and a really good expert in you know, Regis University is Larissa Boulevard. Can you expand, I know you know and you've been researching, it's already here. So can you expand on that a little bit more, please? Uh, well, I've been doing some research on, and, and I definitely want to hear what Adam has to say, but this is actually a good time to bring this up because um, it appears that Monsanto is already working its way here. We, as a community, have been investigating. I myself have been, but other community members have, as well. Um, there was a, a business called United Cannabis, and they had appointed to their board a, a gentleman named John C. Hunter III, who was the CEO of Monsanto's company, Solutia, and he's a financial advisor, um, and he's saying that he's not being paid and that he has no stake, but, you know, it still raises a considerable red flag. Um, because any of us that have a corporate background, I do myself, and I worked at a billion dollar evaluated clean tech company, um, we know how these businesses are strategized. And so um, we have to really be vigilant as a community who we're letting into the industry if we want to start fighting this from the ground level, which we have this opportunity. Mike Bowman brings up Monsanto. They will come in, but they're not going to come in with a Monsanto sign and say, woohoo! here. They're going to come in very sneakily. But you have to understand that if somebody is an executive with a business, that they are a stakeholder some way, somewhere. They are going to benefit from this relationship. So, um, yeah, that's all I have to say for, about that for now. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah, we actually broke that story on the Adam Dunn show, by the way. <laughs> so, um, and that is part of this industry that we're trying to I mean, one of the things about this whole industry is that it is grassroots and it has been always and that's one of the nice things about being involved because you know you're not working for a big corporation, you're working for the people, you know, and that's kind of where I think uh, hemp has always been and it's, I, I lived in Amsterdam for 20 years and over there they, they had the chance, they, had, they, they literally had this power in their hands and they just dropped the ball and now they're back pedaling and they're trying to figure it out. And it's quite interesting because the, as Colorado becomes stronger, Europe becomes weaker when it comes to, when it comes to hemp. And we haven't even started, you know, we've barely even scratched the surface and we're already producing 
equal to the amounts that, like, for instance, Netherlands produces about 900 hectares a year. It's not that much. We did 300 this year. So give us a few years, and we will definitely lead this, uh, the, the world, really, with hemp. And that's, to most people, don't really understand, because cannabis is very sexy. Of course, everybody goes for that. Every news, everything is always based on cannabis. It's not based on hemp. Is very much always been considered sort of the, you know, the, the the cousin of, and it wasn't really that important. It's the most important plant in the planet. You know, it can take over. It can basically uh, sequester all of the CO2 problems we have, and all these little issues. Every issue that we have, it's interestingly enough. It always kind of comes back to the most simple things. You're like, well, this plant could produce all the oxygen we need, take in all the CO2, you build houses out of it. The houses are actually like sucking in CO2 and sucking in carbon and taking, they're holding it. So these are the things that we need to, to put our research money towards. I mean, we haven't even put a dime towards this stuff and we're still, we're figuring this out with our own money. You know, we're not using government money to do it. So how, because Colorado is large, largely rural, we're city people sitting here in Denver. But how do we educate and take the fear out of the farmers' minds to grow hemp and uh, to the, actually I think the profit. banks have to get involved or else the farmers will never be not scared because that's the key is that they're always looking at the fact that if they don't have a bank behind them like they normally do, they have crop support. I mean, any crop out there has got insurance built onto it. Cannabis is ne or hemp has never had this, and it probably won't very easily. I mean, I'm sure they'll do everything they can to not guarantee your crop so that you have a chance that you could lose your whole entire existence on one cycle. But most people have a guarantee sort of built in, and hemp needs that also. Robin, we're talking about banks here. You're the queen of cannabis and banking. Well, it's a, it's a tough issue, as most of you know. Um, I you know, when the co-op bill was presented as a banker, I thought, oh, that's just never going to work. But the more I think about it and the more I, you know, I, I've actually met with the head of Marijuana Enforcement Division here in Colorado and also um, the head of the Colorado Enforcement Division and the Assistant Attorney General about um, opening up access uh, kind of a, a financial information um, highway between banks who choose to bank marijuana-related businesses and the MED, which is required under FinCEN guidance. Right now, I think there are about eight banks in the state of Colorado that are openly banking marijuana-related businesses, and, um, and they're not publicizing it, certainly. And you're, no, you're not going to see banks publicize it anytime Why soon. Why not? Well. I actually have customers say to me, I hope you're not banking marijuana-related businesses. Um, customers of other businesses, and my answer is, they don't know I'm banking you. It's none of your business who I bank. But uh, people have, people have, uh, uh, there. we all know people have a predetermined notion of, of what they think is acceptable to be banked in their bank. Um, but the more I think about the co-op, the big obstacle is it being able to access the Federal Reserve. But if we could get over that obstacle, then you do have a specialized bank that understands the FinCEN guidance, understands the industry, understands the agricultural aspect of hemp, and is very specialized in that. And if you limit that co-op to marijuana-related businesses only, so you don't have other bankers seeing this competition that really isn't competition because they're not accepting that business anyways, um, I think it makes sense. The, I, the, realistically, what we're, uh, the, the soonest I think we're gonna see federal action possibly could be uh, where they give a safe harbor to banks that are located in states where some form of marijuana is legal. Um, but until that happens, you're just not going to see the banking industry open up. When, when do we, you think that we're going to see the feds change their position? Because as we all know, Obama's been wishy-washy. Eric Holder's been wishy-washy. Nobody wants to give us an answer. When I, are we going to see answers? We're going to see answers when we have someone like Mike Dunifin is our governor who is pro-cannabis and fighting for this industry. We have to, we have this huge um, business community right here. We've got so many business owners here and, um, and so you're fighting from this grassroots side 
and you've got to have that person at the top that has the access in the bully pulpit to speak for you in a positive way and to fight for you. And that's why you need Mike. Uh, can Miguel? I have a quick question I have real quick, please? Um, now, I know the interest for banking has been for the industry to put its money in a safe place. Where do we see the discussion and when can we expect to see a discussion of where the interest is for small businesses to at least have an opportunity to take out a loan so they can come out and open up their stores too? Well, I think if you, if you aren't familiar with the FinCEN guidance, it's about five, six, seven pages, and you're in this industry, you should know it. And if you understand how complicated it is for a bank to do business with a marijuana-related business, I mean, the government has made it extremely onerous, just to figure out the, de de the deposit side of it requires additional personnel, it requires um, additional capital requirements because there's so much money in this industry that actually is not in the banks now. And when those deposits come flowing into the banks, capital requirements then go up. It's, it's a very complicated banking situation. Really though, that's the answer to the loan side because once you, a bank starts having those deposits flow in, they need to make a return on investment for those and they need to loan them out. So you, you need the deposits coming in and then you've got the demand on the other side. It's still though that onerous regulation with the FinCEN guidance, that's not gonna go away. Even if we get a safe harbor at the congressional level for banks in states where it's legal, that FinCEN guidance isn't gonna go away until it is 100% legal at the federal level. Sean, you've been holding yeah, on. Yeah, you know, really, really quickly. First of all, I want to um, thank you, uh, Robin, for what you're doing at your bank and other and these other banks that are really being the entrepreneurs because they're really honoring what the will of Colorado voters are. That we want every aspect of our community to benefit, including the financial services industry. So thank you for that. And also, I completely agree with you that the real answer is having folks like you as Lieutenant Governor, Mike Donovan as Governor, being um, real spokespeople for this industry as opposed to our current governor who's become the poster boy for the prohibition side. And the, the reason why that's important is this, because um, we're talking about these FinCEN guidance. Uh, I totally agree with you that the Obama administration has been very wishy-washy on this. I can tell you who's been absolutely abundantly clear, the parliamentarians of the United States House. There was an amendment that was passed in an appropriations bill that said that the FinCEN guidance that she's talking about is legal and that they can pay for do it. Here's the thing. You can't change law in an appropriations bill. The parliamentarians of the House said, yeah, if you follow these complicated, hard, anti-business, anti-growth, un-American guidelines, you can do it. But yes, that must mean it must be legal under current law because you cannot change law in an appropriations bill. So I think that's right. It's really important that folks understand the importance of having people in elected office here in the state who are going to spokes people who win these sorts of news stories are misreported, they clear up the record, say, yeah, this is what we must do. Thank you. So we're getting a lot of questions, which I really appreciate, and I think that we need to um, talk to the listeners and viewers out there. So what I'm gonna do, I just made this executive decision. I'm just gonna read some questions, and if one person can answer it shortly and briefly, and then I'll read another question, whomever wants to answer it, we'll do it that way. Do you guys like that? Yeah. All right. So. Um, my daughter takes cannabis for brain cancer. She takes high THC meds, not CBD. Will education on cannabis include that THC for children is safe and eliminate the fears associated with kids on psychoactive meds? I'd rather refuse narcotics that also make her high from her doctors. Excuse my bad handwriting. <laughs> uh, you can answer that. Definitely. Uh, you know, going back to uh, what they were talking about, that there is this huge rally right now about edibles and about the fact that, oh, your children can get a hold of it, or oh, this and that. There's what, five, six of us moms in here that our children take more than a gram a day? That's a thousand milligrams. And they are fine. They're happy, they're healthy children. I guarantee you every person in this room has 50 or more items in your house that if my child got a hold of a tiny bit, he would end up in the hospital or dead. Tylenol, toothpaste, 
Clorox, laundry soap. I mean, the list is endless. If you drink too much water, you can die. How many people have vinegar and you know all your cleaning products under the sink? I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous that people think our children are going to be hurt by any product. And I think it, it really does go back to having responsible business owners that are making responsible products. If you're making BHO in your basement and you blow your neighborhood to hell, that's obviously not a responsible person, and none of us want to do business with that person or be associated with them. There is going to be bad people in every group, and America as a society loves to abuse things. There is not only Narcotics Anonymous, there's Alcohol Anonymous, Shopping Anonymous, Sex Anonymous. You know, th the list is endless. We've got to really put in front of the people these stories, these success stories of all of these children, adults, veterans, you know, our mothers, grandparents. I mean, I have met somebody from every generation that has been helped by this plant, not harmed. Can anybody say that for any other substance out there? Honestly? Thank you. Our next question, how do we make marijuana or something more mainstream um i'm sorry i have terrible eyes you guys but that's the question how do we make marijuana more mainstream jason you answer that there's a lot of ways i, I think the key there is really education as it was talked about before just you know when you're in the grocery store you have the conversations uh, Personally, I'm from the Midwest. Most of my family does not agree with what I do and, and thinks we're all a bunch of demons. So, you know, when you're home for holidays, wherever it may be, have those conversations. I, I think that's the biggest thing we can all do. Um, and to Sierra's point, you know, with, with the folks who, who are timid or, or worried about the side effects, you know, there's a huge misconception that there's not enough studies out there. It couldn't be further from the truth. There's literally hundreds of peer-reviewed studies. So, you know, whoever the parent was that submitted that, I would encourage you to, to look at those, and not only for your own peace of mind, but to share those with your physician as well. Thank you. The mayor, you've been so quiet over there. Well, I have important people up here <laughs> that have things to say. I want to, we're back to Tom's question again about how do we change this. It's a very, very important thing to understand. In the Metro Mayor's Caucus, there's 41 mayors from seven counties. Those mayors will take a stand for or against a particular issue that's before the people. If it's a plebiscite or a motion by the legislators, they must come to 100% consensus. Now, these are the mayors in small towns and big towns. The Metro Mayor's Caucus is fairly unique in the United States in that mayors don't normally talk with each other on a regular basis. They have their own issues to deal with in their respective communities. The Denver Metro Mayor's Caucus, 41 mayors, must reach 100% consensus to take, a, to take a stand. Now, they were going to take a stand against Amendment 64 I gave them 28 pages on the Volstead Act. That was, that was prohibition of alcohol. 28 pages footnoted a complete research paper and also the history of the war on cannabis and the history of the war on marijuana. Half of the mayors, and this is back to answering this question, half of the mayors did not know what the Volstead Act was. None of them knew why 64 had to be a constitutional amendment, throwing it into the 10th Amendment of the United States Constitution. None of them knew that. Mayor, when, I, when isn't they, that the fault of the people for electing mayors who don't know what the hell is yes, in the law? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. But that does not solve our problem here. <laughs> our problem, once again, is education. And when those mayors found out the following, half of them changed their mind on 64. Not publicly. But that's our job. When we start throwing them out of office, they will publicly come out. Why did they change their mind on 64? When they found out that it was Hearst DuPont, Andrew Mellon, Pulitzer, 
and Andrew Mellon's son-in-law, Henry Anslinger, and it was about saving nylon and promoting newsprint and the first two arrests. They were blown away to find out that the first two people arrested in the new marijuana, marijuana war, which Pulitzer, by the way, put into action because marijuana was to degradate the Mexicans. It's the Mexican word for hemp. And they attached this racist war to that name. When they found out the first two arrests were George Caldwell and Moses Baca for four joints, Caldwell got four years at hard labor in 1938 in Leavenworth, Kansas, and Moses Baca got 18 months for four lousy, and you guessed it, ragweed joints coming out of a ditch someplace. And they were willing, those cronies, to put together a war on a word that has cost us millions of lives and trillions of dollars. When people find that out, they say, oh my God, why? How could we have done such a thing? When you tell that story to the average guy, he says, I don't believe it first. And you say, go find out for yourself, it's true. And everything else in your corporate existence is exactly the same way, and the only thing that is going to change it is us. So. Thank you. So uh, this, I'm, I'm gonna go through the questions, but this is actually perfect for you to grab the mic because this is for you. Wayward Bill asks, as we improve our cannabis laws, are we going to give compassionate, I think that's amnesty to, amnesty there, you were missing the why. Amnesty to only cannabis offenders. Yeah. Do, are, where's the compassion? We're locking away that's, so many nonviolent offenders and throwing away the key. How do we change it's that? A, it's a great question, and, and as a matter of fact, I made a suggestion to the Republican candidate for governor that if he really wanted to advance his own campaign, it seemed to me one of the things he could do is say, look, um, I, uh, the governor, the present governor, Hickenlooper, has already said that he would not in any way, shape, or form go for any sort of reduction in the sentence or, or a, um, actually letting anyone out of prison that had been arrested for a crime that is no longer a crime, you know, which we should do. We should let them all out. There is no reason to keep anybody in jail for something that is not a crime today. And anybody running for governor should say that, it seems to me. But here's the problem, guys. And, and it really does go to exactly what we're talking about here. And I still must tell you, I don't think we have arrived at the answer, or at least one that I think will work. Remember what we're up against. We're up, ag we're up against the pharmaceutical industry that we, everybody has already identified. We're up against the sheriff. We're up against the law enforcement agencies that, may, again, there's a lot of money involved in the war on drugs on the other side of this thing. And so, and so it's going to be tough. You, if we do not, if you do not come together with some sort of plan and financial support for a, an, uh, an advertising something or other that will tell everybody, you know, we can talk to ourselves about how to educate people and, and go to our friends and our relatives and, and have these conversations. It will not win, you not win the day. We will lose this issue. It will get repealed, I will tell you, unless you have a very strong advertising campaign to educate the public. Part of what everybody should be doing here, it seems to me that what people in business is establishing a fund for that purpose. Because if you don't ed educate the public, and it's not just happening around the water cooler and at your, you know, at, at, at a party uh, where you can talk to your friends, it's got to be to the soccer moms. They're, these are the people who are scared to death that their kids are going to be negatively affected by this change that we've made in Colorado law. If you don't change that, I'll tell you right now, we will lose this, well, this issue. And so that get, get, get together, fund a, an advertising campaign that educates the public. It, you go on television, you tell the stories that these people have told. These are compelling stories. Can you but talk they don't happen. I mean, they're not going to get out unless you actually fund it. Can you talk about the sunset review policies in regards to our current medical marijuana program? No, I can't. Who can? Because Jason B. wants to know. Oh, oh I don't know. Sunset, 
This year, 1284 does sunset. Um, you know, I don't know how public the details, maybe it is public, Mr. Coleman would know better. I, I think there's definitely some, some troubling things that, that they're looking at doing. Um, if anyone's familiar or followed, we've got a, another caregiver bill coming up this year. And, and essentially, they're, they're trying to, to knock down the six plants. They're trying to do away with pain on the registry, um, all kinds of problematic things. And basically, the, the trouble that I've read through 1284 is exactly the same thing they're trying to do in that bill. Um, they're just going to bring it back for, for a one-two punch, if you will. Um, just really quickly, I, I, if I could add to, to Mr. Tancredo, um, Part of the reason I personally want to see Mike in office is, is I'll get to go hiking again. Um, last year we ran a bill, uh, SB 218, which would have sealed the records for anything legal under 64. So that bill in the political process failed. This year we're bringing that back, but we're also bringing a bill back to look at getting everyone out of prison in Colorado at the state level. So. Awesome. So now we have to move. I know you guys are excited to talk. And what I want to do again is I want to move to the next topic. Sierra, you're going to speak. Um, and the topic is for all of you, cannabis, the cure, how is cannabis saving lives in Colorado? And then after she speaks, I really want to go continue to move around and ask questions because there are a lot of questions that people want to hear from you guys about. I think that's the best way to do this. Sierra, thanks. Uh, so cannabis is most definitely saving lives in Colorado. Uh, I have been fortunate enough that my child was one of those. But there are still a lot of children that are fighting. And unless we have people in office that are going to help us with like, you know, the caregiver bill and things like that, um, our children are not real, they will not receive the best care. Six plants is not enough for my child. At a gram a day, there's no way that that's enough for my child to sustainably take his cannabis oil. Um, I know a, a lot of parents here that, you know, a lot of us are not from here. We are marijuana refugees. We are from other states. We fled our state to come here to have safe access. But yet, more and more, I'm being contacted by these amazing people because they need us to come and testify at Congress because they're trying to introduce this bill or that bill that's taking away our children's rights. And if you have never met any of our children, your, I mean, your life will be instantly changed to see what they were and to see what they are now. Uh, and there's so many different cases. It's not just cancer, blood cancer, which is what my son has. There's brain cancer. There is Crohn's disease. A, a young man is really showing what cannabis can do for Crohn's. There is autism. I mean, I don't think people understand and realize how bad it is. There's 46 children a day diagnosed with cancer every single day. There is one in 26 children affected with epilepsy every single day. And these children have no hope because we are just pretty much guinea pigs to pharmaceuticals. They, you know, sponsor this medication or that one and your hospital gets that money. If your child fits into that group, then they will try this experimental drug on you. As everybody, you know, knows with my story and a few other moms, you cannot say no. You have no rights. And when cannabis is literally proving to save lives, why is it not legal? Why is it that we have to, you know, be criminals? It's, um, you know, and it's, and it's not just terminal illness. Hey, my child has pain issues. I do not want my child on Oxycontin at two years old when he started. He's four now, he's been off of it for a while, thank God, until he's, you know, 50 years old or even my age. Does anybody in this room want their child on narcotics long term? Because that's the reality that my fellow canna moms are facing. There are children up at Denver and Aurora and in Colorado Springs right now that do not have access to it because their doctors will call CPS. We're having to sneak it to our children and that should not be the case when there is so many of them walking around living proof. There, there's actually a question from the audience that goes to this. How soon can we expect school districts to accept cannabis as a medication and not allow it to force kids to medicate 1,000 feet off campus? But soon your child is yes. not going to be four yes. and is going to need to go to elementary school. Yes. What do you do and what do you tell other parents to do to treat their children? Yeah, that, these are all things that I don't think any of us thought about. 
because our children were dying when we came here. We just wanted to see them live. Now that they're living, we have to deal with school. We have to deal with being in public. We have to deal with things that, that you would never think about. If the postman walks by my house and my son is holding a Keef Cola or a medicated whatever, he not knowing who my child is, he's going to call the cops. He's going to call CPS, which then brings all of those issues. I can tell you guys right now, if my son was on Adderall, if he was on morphine or Oxycontin, he'd march his little butt down to the nurse's office and they'd give it to him. If I try to give him cannabis, even just a candy, okay, you don't even have to administer it. All you have to do as a nurse is make sure he doesn't choke on it, okay? That's it. They will say no and they will, you know, try to make it to where my child cannot go to that school. There's a mom facing, uh, a couple moms facing these issues right now. We are being discriminated against and so are our children because we choose to go the cannabis route, because we choose not to buy into pharmaceuticals. And because of that, our children are suffering. And until we elect the proper people, until people without sick children join our side, yes. we're not gonna get anywhere. We're gonna have to you know, have either substandard care, or we're gonna have to take on those even more enormous roles besides raising a terminally ill child, which is you know, teaching them and, and doing all of these things. It's an absolute disgrace, in my opinion, that they have put their noses so far in my business that my son can't go to public school. And unless I want to lie to them, you know, who in here wants to teach your children to lie? You know, don't tell anybody, honey, sneak off to the bathroom and eat your cannabis pill, but don't tell anybody. You know, it's, it's something that needs to be thought of because now, guess what? My child's not dead, he's going to live. And so are many others and they need yep. to be thought of. If I they may follow need to up, be thought yeah. of. Chair is absolutely right. We need, and by the way, I'm, I'm David K. Williams. I'm the Libertarian uh, candidate for Attorney General. Thank you. And I've heard a lot about the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. Um, screw them both. There is a, a, the trend in this, and Tom screwed them four years ago and he ran as a third party. Mike Dunafin is a leader in this issue. Tom is a leader on this issue. We don't need just clerks and managers, or in my case, just lawyers or office managers. We need leaders in this industry. We need people that will stand on the courthouse steps or on the Capitol steps, wherever it may be, and take a position and make these cases that Sierra is making and make these cases that everybody else here is making in this room. We need to make it to people outside of this room. And that's why I'm running for Attorney General, because it's not just about enforcing laws. It's about being a leader in this position. It's about spreading the word. It's about changing society. It's not about rubber stamping what other people have to do. So as, as a candidate for Attorney General, you are the head prosecutor of the state, or you would be, of the state of Colorado. What can you tell people here and on the panel, what can you ensure or usher us will or will not happen with cannabis laws? Well. The Attorney General is an executive position, so that gives him a lot of leadership in, uh, uh, with the media. Y nobody here, you would all laugh if you thought, well, is Hickenlooper or Bupre ever going to get out there and take a position on this, a leadership position? No. Are, is either Don Quick or Cynthia Kaufman going to take a leadership position on this? No, absolutely not. Somebody will, Mike Dunafin will. What would your leader po David leadership Williams position will. be on a mother who wants her child Get the government out of it. Let, the, let her do it. It's her child. It's her. It's her. She, she knows what's best for her child. And part, one of the uh, parts of the Attorney General's office is what they call a legislative liaison. It's lobbyist is what that is. And to have somebody down there at the state capitol defending Sierra and people like her and saying we need someone to pass these laws or to encourage the legislators to pass these laws and to give them some political cover because none of them have any courage, very few, I won't say none, very few of them have any courage, but somebody needs to be down there to give them that coverage and an attorney general can do that. And the attorney general also advises the Department of Regulatory Agencies, DORA for short, and we need to make sure that DORA is not over-regulating medical marijuana, um, uh, hemp, edibles, all of it. Because right now they're trying to regulate it to death. And if anybody thinks any part of the two-party duopoly is going to change that, I think you all know that that's wrong. The two-party duopoly is shrinking in numbers. And registered voters in the Republican and the Democratic Party continue that. Throw that, throw that history off. 
Vote for what you believe in. Vote for what you know is right and not what some collective master is trying to tell you to do for the sake of the team. Screw the team. Look where it's gotten us. So um, Inez, Inez asks, what all needs to take place in order to make more money available for independent medical cannabis research? Which is a really important question because we're talking about regulation here and arrests and all of that, but we haven't touched on research. <clears throat> I would yeah, I would love to address this one. Um, one, of course, having money available to do it is great, um, but we have money allocated to do that. We just can't get the studies through. We've been in active discussions with um, CU Boulder, University of Denver, and we usually get our programs all the way through until they need to be signed off by the dean. And then the latest we heard is they wanted um, the cannabis to come directly from the University of Mississippi. Let me figure out how to jump through that hoop, and then we'll start some research. So it's not that money necessarily needs to be available. There's a lot of responsible companies out there that are looking to do this kind of research. And really, the only option for us is to go um, overseas uh, to conduct research in other countries and then bring it back into the United States. Um, I'm currently working in Illinois and a lot of these new states coming on board that are um, setting up regulated cannabis businesses actually have as an extra credit piece of the application phase to submit a research plan. And that's really making folks reach out to these universities, to people at the traditional medicine institutions, hospitals, and to get them on board. Even if that entity can't be on board, that person who has that know-how, who knows that process, can come on board. And a lot of these entities are funding these in these new states coming online. So even though it's not gonna be these massive scale projects that we see with an FDA approval or, so, or something of that nature. There are a lot of small studies going on all across the country right now as we speak, and they're going to continue to pick up steam, and I think a lot of that data is going to come out here in the next couple of years and really drive larger projects. Thank you. Miguel and Tiny, I, I have a question for you from somebody anonymously with a cute little bunny drawing <laughs> somebody. Um, but this is, this is interesting because you do the 420 rally and working at Fox News, I've seen the negative videos that they have from the 420 rally. The question is, is marijuana tourism, or is marijuana bad for tourism in Colorado? What have you seen? Um, it's evident that it, is, it, that it is not. So if you're deaf, dumb, or blind, uh, then you'd have to be a dummy to believe that it isn't because you could see by the numbers that have grown since the enduring ambition and the core of the movement. What is that? That is the parents and the children of the 60s and the 70s who protested the government, who was in our lives, who was in wars, who was invasive in everything we did. And so it was a symbol of us protesting the invasive government. And it, it, it included not just the Vietnam War, the civil rights movement, it included ma marijuana prohibition and it evolved from there. So, you know, the, the tourism is serving as a beacon of hope for people around the world since America is responsible for building these laws and these UN treaties that have been established around the globe and you see uh, innocent Australians who have traveled to foreign countries in Australia in a documentary some of us know as Ganja Queen where they were used as mules and killed. So, you know, it, it is a very great thing that people want to see and feel and experience because as you know, we've had many battles with our attorney Rob Corey in the city that we are in the middle of what is represented democracy, the Greek amphitheater, Civic Center Park between City Hall and the state government. And so we, we've seen many things there in you know uh, Civic Center Park, uh, a very broad range from conservative to liberal from you know, counter demonstrations of the Klan during the Martin Luther King marades. I've seen those all. And so but have it's you great seen to more tourists and Adam, I see that you want to yeah, say over, this, but, but, this but you, you guys let, are let me answer one two, question. Let's finish talk, that real quick. But you have to this year my you will question. see more tourism because what was once a dream is now a reality where people had a vision 
The 420 rally will look just like the Taste of Colorado this 2015 with the full street closure and expanded hours from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. And it's just like every other group. You know, uh, I'm, I'm gay, but you know, it, it, it's marijuana, so we're here to smoke pot, get used to it. That was the answer I wanted, <laughs> Adam. Uh, one of the things I've noticed, I mean, when I moved back here five years ago, the biggest question people always asked me was like, what's the difference between here and Amsterdam? And, and the difference, the main difference was the fact that in Amsterdam they had this, Basically, I think if you take the two parties and put them together, you'd have the perfect system. Because in Holland, they don't acknowledge the growers. The growers don't exist. There is no grower. There is nothing. You have, it just magically appears into the shop, and then it is sold, and then the tax money is collected and is given to the government. So they have a very simple mind, which is like, we want your money, and we want to take it from you, and that's it. There's not a, like a reason or an incentive for it. Now, in Colorado, they have the exact opposite problem. They have all these places that are selling cannabis, and you're open to any tourist from anywhere in the world. So say you come in from Nicaragua and you're, you're gonna experience uh, freedom in America for the first time, you have nowhere to go smoke this cannabis. You, can, you can't go anywhere, there's no park. There's, you can't, parks are closed off, hotels are closed off, everything is closed off. So there's not really an option and the idea that, to, yeah, exactly. And the idea that, <laughs> that we're gonna treat it like, to, like alcohol is completely absurd because every single corner of Denver is a bar. I mean, there's a bar within any, if you live in the center of Denver, you can get to a bar in five minutes, no problem. And you're not gonna be pen penalized for it or you're not gonna be treated differently. But when it comes to cannabis, I mean, my shop, the hood lab that I was running with my wife, I mean, we were like the only beacon of freedom for many people here. And a lot of people came to my spot and were like, why is there not more places like this? And I'm like, because people have no balls and they don't wanna like go out there and just do it. Uh, we, we never had a problem with it. We never really had a problem with, we had problems with the police and that was about sound issues, obvious things that you would do. Never about cannabis. They would walk in and say, no, we don't care about the cannabis because this is the, this is, I mean, it's a few blocks away from here. In this area of Denver, it's definitely pretty liberal and mellow and it's not such a big problem. But when it comes to the idea of that there's not one safe place in this entire state that you can go to and smoke cannabis without fear of being like uh, persecuted in any way, shape, or form, it just t makes it completely asinine. So I think somebody, once, and that's, that, that I think was the reason, when I first saw the video from Mike, I saw one sign on, in the cage that said, we need a place to smoke. And I was like, that's my guy right there. I was like, that's, that's what I need. I need somebody like, who understands the realities of what people need. And we're not very difficult. Uh, one thing people understand when anybody, when, when you're around people with cannabis, we're not difficult people. We're about the easiest people you could ever deal with. We just need a nice, safe place, relaxed. A little maybe warm would be nice too, you know what I mean? But we're even not even too worried about that. We'll deal with it, you know what I mean? So. Just, yeah, there, just, there's it, there's less fighting here than when I'm on a panel with like one Republican at Fox News. Oh, for this sure. This is like so nice. I, I love would, this. I you know, imagine. another thing I noticed too. Uh, you know, take take a look at last 420. About 50 percent of the people I talked to that day. Hey, how you doing? You, you from Colorado? No, nah, we just heard about the 420 rally and everything that's going on up here. I mean, everybody was here. Every A-list star was here. The radio stations were talking about, oh, we don't know why all the people are here. Yeah, they're here for the pop, but, you know. And, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the news was talking about it. You know, so-and-so was seen on this street or at this restaurant, you know. They all came for the freedom of being able to chill out and relax in a free state. Mayor. There's actually a question about the freedom to smoke. What will you do to, endure, to ensure or help cannabis users have social clubs and places to go outside of their own homes to socially interact with others that choose cannabis over alcohol? Home rule cities have their statutes superseded by the, the Colorado regulatory statutes. So there is a rather vague law about open consumption of cannabis. In Glendale, we like to call Glendale the Luxembourg of Liberty, the Vatican of Freedom. We have, uh, we have what is called a common sense consumption law. Consume. Don't be a jackass. That's, and so there's a video online of the two types of policing that you could do. It's on, on the website, Donovan for Governor. And Sarge comes out and busts some people for smoking. And then we fast forward 
to the reality of the possibilities of living in a free society where he takes the cuffs off and they, he stands there and they continue to consume and he wishes them a good day. We've got to change the state law. Let it be a matter of local concern. People can figure that out on their own. If, and you can move away from a town that doesn't want that to happen. But it shouldn't be a, it shouldn't be a state law. And it should be changed. And when I'm governor, we will, f we will talk about changing that law. In the meantime, Glendale will not enforce it. It will have to be enforced by the gendarmes from the Capitol. Thank you. Sean, we are now switching topics. Topic three, the regulation of cannabis and hemp and what needs to change. You are the lobbyist, so you know a lot about the laws. I, I, I know a thing or two about it. Um, I'm going to copy off of Mike, as he said it was OK to talk about something else first. I want to quickly um, finish this tourism aspect of it, because I think it's really important to um, just throw out some data. Since I'm a lobbyist, I'm a nerd. I like to have numbers. So um, according to the state of Colorado's own data that they pay for, 40% um, of front range um, retail marijuana dispensaries, 40% of their customers are tourist guests of the state. In the mountain and rural communities, that number goes up to 90%. Let me say that again, 90%. These are people, and so when you talk about what's good or bad for tourism, it, what apparently is clear is that cannabis is great for tourism. Um, it's not only great for tourism in Colorado, it's also secretly great for tourism all up and down um, the I-8 corridor. I learned this by accident. I was on a little bit of a road trip to the, a music camp that I teach at in Vermont, and I'm staying in a hotel room, and this guy sees my driver's, Colorado driver's license, he's like, oh my god, this is awesome. People are coming back and forth to Colorado all the time. And I gotta tell you, there is nobody more opposed to legalization of marijuana nationwide than the folks at the Motel 6 in Davenport, Iowa. <laughs> but what I tell you is terrible for tourism is the Colorado Highway Patrol. Because now we have all these guests of our state terrified of all these cops he's seen flying around. So I'm gonna, cause I, can, I can attest to what Mike Dunifin is saying about his city of Glendale because I was literally in Glendale and I saw a police officer because their approach is that they are not there to bust you, they're there to be ambassadors of the city. I literally saw a police officer light a gentleman's joint for him. <laughs> that is public service. That's awesome. <laughs> All right, so now you got to make the sub the segue into uh, your topic. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna switch. Just <laughs> switch. Just switch it up. So um, the, here is something that we all must be aware of, that this is an incredibly important year in terms of marijuana policy in the state of Colorado, because as a lobbyist, when people come and approach, you know, someone like me or Samantha, my partner, who's in, in, in the audience here, um, usually it's trying to get lawmakers to do something that they already don't want to do. In terms of the Sunset Review, which was like one of the questions you had earlier, this is not a, this is a must do. It is a statutory requirement. There will absolutely be a bill regarding the regulation of marital marijuana in the state of Colorado next session. And what I can tell you is that the only safe position to have is the pen in Mike Donovan's hands. So you need to spend the next 48 hours making sure that's where that pen's going to be. Yeah. Because if, it, it doesn't really matter between Bob Opre and John Hickenlooper. You are not going to like what that bill says. Okay? So I want to make sure everybody understands that. Um, but in terms of what we need to do, there are so many things, I don't know where to start, so I'm going to try and um, highlight what I think is actually the most important one, because I think it actually solves all the underlying problems. And, the number, and this problem is license suitability. And the reason why I say this solves all the other problems, because this is the core of stigma. This is the essence of the uh, Corrections uh, Corporation America's philosophy. The idea that once you belong to us, you always belong to us. The idea that someone could have gone to jail for selling cannabis, which by the way, I don't know if you know about this, but in order to go to jail for selling cannabis, you probably gotta be pretty good at it, right? The idea that you can't get a job and when we say, oh, recidivism, well, people get in trouble again because 
they don't have a job because you don't know where they are. You don't know what they're doing. They don't have a place to live. So you mean to tell me it's good public policy when you are saying that you want to get rid of the black market, you mean all the people that you've been arresting in this cat and mouse game for selling weed, those people, to lock them out when they're saying all we want to do is pay you a little bit of money, tell you exactly what we're doing and exactly where we're doing it. That is madness, okay? That's, that's madness. So, so to your point about crime, as a lobbyist, you obviously deal with the prison lobby. And that is at so many levels. I have a client, I'm a criminal defense attorney, I have a client who has to put money in to call me. And I don't know, it's probably $2 a minute that we have to, for our conversation. So it's like $100 to talk to the guy. That is all part of the prison industry. Right. How do we change or how do you change as a lobbyist from the prison industry into the marijuana industry? Well, I mean, so first of all, hire me and spend a lot of money. Um, no, I'm actually, I'm actually totally joking. Here, here is the bigger issue: that folks who you don't, the way you usually come by being a lobbyist is that you came by being a lobbyist because you have a really huge, impressive Rolodex. Go anyway, that one right there. Yeah, I know. That was, was, was some purpose. I thought you were going to talk about something else. <laughs> I know. Um, and the only way you come by their old decks is that you have to be as establishment as you possibly can be. Like Jared Polis, congressional staff, are working on Capitol Hill, right? So um, the problem is that now you are trying to do this little dance of the reason, the only reason you lawmaker are talking to me at all because you feel like it's a safe thing to do, but. I'm trying to trick you. In order for me to do that, I have to actually really believe in me trying to trick this person. I can't just be a hired gun, right? Because I'm gonna get seduced into thinking what they want because if I'm just a hired gun, like you're paying me today, but somebody who has a lot more money can be paying me tomorrow because if I'm a career lobbyist, yeah, sure, it's great to be on the right side of history and morality and science and all those things, but it's way better to get those CCA contracts and those COGA contracts because then you get to make 10 grand a month doing absolutely fuck all, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, I mean who, who wants to go to another Capitol and actually attend a hearing when you could be across the street at Capitol Guru having martinis? <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. So. That's the problem. What we need to do as a movement is identify the people who are actually really on our side. And then, well, I mean, look, reality is also we're going to start paying these folks. That's true. Not everybody's, not everybody's as a, as a um, well, you know, look, I'm, I used to be a classic musician. I mean, I took an oath of poverty a long time ago, so I'm okay with it. But the reality is that is absolutely essential that not only do the folks in this movement, in this community, start making sure that the people who are lobbying our issue actually understand the issue. It's also really important that we start showing up with our votes in November, with our voices at the Capitol doing session, and with withholding our support for folks who are not actually on our side. This is not a single issue issue. This is everything. The reality is that because of the war on cannabis and the war on, on marijuana specifically, most people who look like me are institutionally barred from achieving anything I've ever accomplished. That's the problem. John, I just I just like to add one thing on on, uh, on the on the prison industry in rural Colorado, in every county that has a private prison now by CCA, it is generally speaking the largest taxpayer in the county. So when you try to have a conversation at the state capitol about reducing prison populations and not re-upping leases on these, on these facilities, you get an outcry from the locals. This is, we could possibly have this, what are we going to do? Now the irony of this is, let's say whether it's Kit Carson County or Prowers County or Los Animas or, you, take your pick, doesn't matter. Uh, these are areas rich in, in the resources to grow hemp, to grow marijuana, to, to grow local food, you name it. And we have created a prison industry in rural Colorado in, in the oddest of places. And now with, with, that, with, that, with that combined strength between the lobbies and what, what they are willing to pay to keep that going is astounding. Just astounding. I, I want to I highlight that because I think that people need to understand um, how close the establishment came to fucking this up. 
right? So we had an amendment passed on the second to last day of session in the Colorado Senate, final chamber, we we'll always go back across to the House for consent, that would have allowed people who had at least marijuana crimes to be able to become owners of businesses, to be able to control their own future, because if you have ever tried to get a job with a felony, good luck. It's not a, that's not a thing. That's not a real thing, right? And so we were so proud of ourselves that we had did it. We had made this important policy change. We went to lunch, came back, and somehow, some way, your current governor, John Hickenlooper, in the, in the prison lobby had overturned it, had someone who, and it, was the most, it made me so sick, watching Pat Seven, who's been such a hero on this issue and on civil justice, to have to swallow the amendment he had passed because he was trying to be a Democrat, trying to do the right thing for his party. Um, this, these are the kind of stories that need to be told. As a lobbyist, they do me no good because it's terrible for my career, so I'm telling everybody's dirty laundry. Like, for example, I don't know if Alette Valentine's still in the room, who's running for House District 7. Um, you know, um, the reason, one of the reasons why I came out early and wanted to support her was because there was a bill that was going to say that people who suffer from PTSD would be able to um, use medical marijuana to become part of the registry. Well, Angela Williams, Alette's opponent, voted against it. Well, guess what? As a movement, as a community, we gotta say, well, that's simply not good enough. I don't care what letter's behind your name. If you're voting against my bills, I will find somebody who will vote for them. Thank you. All right, so the last topic. Oh, wait, we quickly, have to I just wanted to add something to that too, is that the, the, the amount of jobs that we're talking about here in these prisons is like a drop in the bucket. And the amount of jobs we could create with hemp growing in these same regions is stupendous. So the people that are afraid to lose their hundreds of jobs, maybe even thousands of jobs. They could be having hundreds of thousands of jobs to, to replace that. And that's the, the part of the whole uh, prison system. The one prison that they tried to turn into a grow, I was very disappointed that it didn't get turned into a grow because that would have been the most symbolic thing that we could have ever done. And we would have shown how much more we can make out of that exact same brick and mortar building a yearly basis compared to ruining people's lives would be actually in, in, in embellishing them. Okay, wait, I just have to play moderator for a second. You two. Jason, uh, Sean, two seconds, two and seconds. then we're going to the last topic because the mayor has to speak. Will the gentleman from Colorado Springs yield? Two seconds. All right, two. <laughs> um, so just because I'll need some more jobs. Um, so currently, there, as of I think about two months ago, there are now more people working in the cannabis industry in the state of Colorado than they are working in law enforcement in the state. Awesome. Jason, this better be good. He didn't realize he was going to get a shameless plug, did he? <laughs> um, you know, I just wanted to reiterate what Sean said. It is absolutely essential. There, there are very few of us as far as lobbyists on the Hill. We need all of you, and not just all of you, but all of your friends, all of your family. When you hear of a bill coming up, like Sierra mentioned, please come testify. That's what makes the difference. It, it's really hard for them to side with the big guys when they have a room full of people. Thank you. All right, like I tried to say, Saving the best topic for last, Mayor Donovan, can you talk to everybody about voting? Because we're here, we're a couple of days away from an election, and we need you to tell everybody to vote and why they need to get out and vote. Because people are, they're upset with the left and the right. Why do we need to go out there? Everything we heard tonight should, uh, and one, I, Patrick asked me to do something I don't normally do, having kiss the Blarney Stone at one point, being Irish, and coming from a farming background, you learn to tell stories because there's nobody in the field but yourself, correct? So you tell them to yourself all the time. Well, eventually somebody listens to them. So I prepared a very short thing, and I, what I did is put together the precy version of what has happened in this conversation over the last year and a half, and the amazing journey that is that I've had in meeting all of you. And we get accused of having a singular issue and that singular issue is cannabis or marijuana. I suggest to you it is a singular issue because every other issue hinges on it. The prison industry, immigration. Ask yourself a question and Tom and I have been friends for a long, long time. I first met, when we first met, we did a video with Tom four and a half years ago, wherein he laid out legalization of hemp. 
And then he got a campaign manager named Bay Buchanan, Pat Buchanan's <laughs> sister. And she said, Tom, you get away from these potheads as fast as you can run. So here's the money for his campaign. Going, it's going to be dried up, washed up, and he's stuck with the issue. We still have that video in a can. I couldn't be more thrilled than to be part of a singular issue that represents immigration, represents law enforcement, it represents what crony capitalism and our willingness as a people to hand over our freedom, increment by increment. We're to blame for this, not them. There aren't very many of them. Unless we play the game, they don't exist. So here we are now at the preface. We're on the edge of losing all of our freedoms. You take a look at the southern border of the United States, it's porous. Tom fights for that all the time. But he, has, he is demonized for doing that because nobody really listens. You listen to him tonight. It's a lot different when you go out and you speak about what is really happening. How in the world did all these families hop on the tops of trains and ride from the southern border of Mexico to the southern border of the United States? Did somebody pick up the phone and say it's okay? Something happened. And what were they running from in Honduras? A war on drugs. Who started that? We did. Reefer Madness started the war on drugs. So now we don't correlate those two problems. So this is very brief, but it's what I've seen and where I think we need to go in the next 48 hours. What we heard today should inspire us, motivate us, frighten us, and above all, anger us. The leaders of our two national political parties depend on one thing, our complicit ignorance. We have a choice to make, continue down this road to serfdom, surrendering each day more of the little freedom we have left. Until we all share the same dim cell, surrounded by our jailers, who watch over us for our own good. The very same people who now call us tax cheats for owning a red card. This type of evil deception can only be based on one thing, our willingness to forget the past. Many of us in this room have experienced firsthand stormtroopers at our door. Our loved ones face down on the floor at gunpoint over a plant. A plant like no other on God's green earth. Its harvest a bounty. Fuel, medicine, building materials, food, and a million other yet undiscovered uses. Yet undiscovered uses is their plan if we do not act. The only patent for research on this planet is held on this plant by the U.S. government. The same government that created a war that has taken the lives of millions of people around the world at the cost of a trillion dollars tells us that we are reckless. They will be right if we do not vote them out of office. The plant, hemp, and its medical cousin, cannabis, glorified for millennia in ancient text, was demonized in a few short years by soulless men who were willing to witness the destruction of families, towns, and countries for profit. Their offspring, today's political class, unchecked, will do the same if we do not stop them. Our voice must be heard. They must understand this is a new day. The dawn of that day 
It's Tuesday, November 4th, 2014. The day the war will end. Yes, we cannabis. I'm gonna play one more song. Uh, this is one of mine, I wrote this. It's, it's just kind of about, um, you know, you face these obstacles in life and um, you just gotta do what you can to stay ahead. Sometimes it seems like everything is conspiring against you. But you just gotta push through it. This is called The Devil Blues. Seen nothing but hell around and wicked wind blowing out from the south. I got spirits lurking up inside my house. Gotta keep on moving, cause that devil's coming up behind. Better men than you have been forsaken And just gotta keep on moving Cause that devil's coming up behind One more time It's my time to die Gotta keep on moving Cause that devil's coming up behind Gotta keep on moving Cause that devil's coming up behind Gotta keep on moving Cause that devil's coming up behind Listen to the old man Listen to the old man When you can 